Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Amanda Jadro, Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As an administrative and financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Alex Bartels and Jason Stroh, moderated by Kurt Bishop. Alex is currently Manager Prepaid Enrollment for Rapid Pay Card. He manages the team responsible for all new clients onboarding as well as ongoing support. Alex was Senior Team Lead Prepaid Enrollment from 2013 through 2014 and an Enrollment Specialist from 2009 to 2013. Alex brings more than five years of enrollment and client support experience to the Rapid Pay Card team. Alex is a graduate from the University of Tampa. Jason is a Senior Manager of Technology and Operations for Unirush LLC. Jason's responsibilities include information security and PCI compliance, production and application support, all internal external websites, applications and services, infrastructure including network and systems teams, partner manager, data centers, and phones. Furthermore, help desk, change management, com configuration management, incident response, and disaster recovery. Kurt, channel manager, Rapid Pay Card, works closely with Tricom to help bring added value to clients by helping them explore electronic pay options to all employees, either by direct deposit to bank accounts or Rapid Pay Card. Rapid supports helps support Tricom in a number of electronic uh, paperless initiatives. Rapid Pay Card is a simple, smart, and secure pay card solution enabling 100% electronic pay, 50 state compliance with robust pay card tools for both employers and cardholders while reducing costs and streamlining administration. Rapid Pay Card can be used anywhere MasterCard or Visa is accepted. The Rapid Access mobile application for iPhone and Android phones and savings accounts bring together an integrated financial solution for employees who demand easy methods to both save and manage money. Customers are provided unparalleled training and support by their dedicated enrollment team throughout the life cycle of their No Charge for Employers program. And in today's webinar, uh, we're going to cover the payroll security and fraud prevention Staffing agencies, through the nature of their business, collect and maintain sensitive payroll data for those they employ. Information security strategies, policies, and training for employees are therefore inherently critical to the prevention of unauthorized access to this sensitive data. In today's edition of the industry webinar, we will cover payroll security and fraud prevention with topics including use of strong passwords, how to recognize phishing and what it is, Aspects of protecting personal and business data. By the end of the session, you'll know what information is protected and how to detect a threat before a breach occurs. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Kurt, Alex, and Jason. Thank you, Amanda. Rapid Pay Card is uh, very uh, excited to be presenting today the Next Generation Payroll Professional Fraud Prevention Webinar, in which, uh, as Amanda said, we'll be helping you uh, look for all of the scary things that are happening in today's instantly connected world. One click of a button can, can uh, cause all kinds of problems. So uh, our, our presenters today will be talking about how to recognize those threats and how to prevent uh, uh, getting in a lot of trouble. So 
Again, Jason Stroh is going to tell you about a lot of scary things to watch out for. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Alex and Jason. Thank you, Kurt. So, so Jason's actually going to start here with, with taking information security personally. Jason. All right, I'm off of mute. So if you could go back up two slides real quick. I think one of my slides somehow got put across, yep, right up here. So <clears throat> taking information security uh, seriously is one of those things that it comes at the personal level. Uh, I believe that you know we, we need to train our employees and our contractors and everybody that we work with to treat uh, customer data as they would treat their own. And the reason it's really coming to focus in the last few years is because everything in the world is now connected. Uh, all your financial information is going to a single location. It's actually made it easier for hackers and fraudsters to uh, to go after this type of information because of the centralized uh, location of the, the, the data. Uh, hackers have instant access to this type of data from anywhere at any time. Uh, new technological advances. It might be awesome to be able to pay a bill from your phone, uh, but if you're on the first generation check pay, uh, that might not always be, you know, that when that first came out, that wasn't always one of the best options because it actually stored an image of the check on your phone. Uh, so if you lost your phone, somebody had all your account information. Uh, simpler for cyber threats uh, to, an, you know, to attack. I've kind of talked about that with the centralization. Uh, fraud prevention for the next generation of, of pay cards is is a continuously evolving uh so in a continuously evolving state, uh, there's always new threats and there's always new preventative methods. Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, the things that we can do about, you know, how to take security for yourself and for your clients and for your workspace seriously. So I'm going to talk about a few of the recent data breaches in the last, uh, let's say, 18 months. And some of these would surprise you. So one major company recently got, you know, was... Uh, got hacked through their HAVC contractor. Basically, these guys started up a fake uh, air conditioning company, and they, the air conditioners they were installing needed network access. Uh, the company did not do their due diligence on the hardware that was being installed, and these guys managed to install uh, a link into a company's network through their, basically their digital HVAC uh, temperature monitors. Uh, another area where a company was breached or it was an accident. Uh, application developer made a mistake. They accidentally published 12 million accounts. Uh, insider jobs, uh, there was a place in New York that had a person placed uh, 18 months in advance. They actually worked there for a year and a half, and uh, that in a year and a half that person was able to develop software that put a back door into the software, and they, were man they managed to access and, and uh, steal 1.8 million accounts. We can move to the next one. Yep. Uh, hacked. Uh, there are businesses that still actually get hacked. Uh, one, of the, one of these instances was a small number of executives were using, not fa following their own pa uh, password policies. Uh, and just on an executive laptop, you know, 1.45 million accounts uh, were stolen. Lost or stolen assets. Once again, laptop was stolen. Uh, lost 100,000 accounts. Uh, or poor security. There's a lot of companies that Everybody thinks their security is great until you have a problem. Uh, one of the largest social networking firms in the country, or actually in the world, uh, has been compromised so many times by brute force uh, that the company itself can't calculate the amount of uh, personal identifiable information that's been lost. So what are we protecting and why are we protecting it? And how does this relate to everybody on the phone call? Well, a small a small issue can lead to a, a bigger problem. So when we're discussing PI, PCI DSS, this is any time a credit card is used. Uh, it's the card, the PAN, which is the the payment card number, the cardholder's name, the expiration date, the CVV or the PIN, uh, any of the information associated that can directly link to a cardholder. Federal PII. This is what the federal government cares that everybody's protecting: is the name, social security number, tax return information. Uh, account numbers that relate to any social entitlement uh, program uh, are all things that we have to protect uh, legally, and we, you know, it, and these are the things you want to treat personally. So if you if you don't think you'd want this type of information of your own put out there in the world, uh, we should make sure these are protected at our companies. 
Um, so what everybody needs to understand is you are the target. Uh, your awareness about security is important, impo just important uh, as anybody else's. Uh, the, one of the major gaps in information security is that there's, there's a lot of times where there's a lack of training and people just don't know. You can go to the next slide, Alex. All right, so how do we take information security per personally? Um, the data you have, whether you realize it or not, has tremendous value. Uh, it might be sold at a data mart. Uh, they might be interested in stealing your data or one of your company's uh, clients' data for identity theft, uh, for monetary theft. Uh, everybody here has received an email before from, you know, or a Facebook invite from, or a strange message across Facebook from a friend whose account's been compromised where, you know, hey, I'm traveling in Europe. Uh, but I left my I lost my wallet and my passport. Could you send me five hundred dollars to so I can get a new passport? And a little bit of due diligence on the use on anybody's behalf would you know you, you make a phone call to your friend, they answer the phone, and they're not in Europe. They're they're at church on Sunday. Um, but people fall for that scam, and so they'll they'll hit the they'll go to Facebook, uh, they'll jeopardize an account, and they'll use somebody else's ID to attack other people. Uh, legal ramifications, uh, if, if you happen to own an account that's used for nefarious activities, uh, you will be held responsible for defending yourself in court, and this happens at companies too. Uh, in most states, the company, if you have something happen from your account, uh, the company has one set of lawyers, and then you are expected to provide your own set of lawyers due to a separation of uh, responsibilities. So passwords, how do you protect yourself? Strong passwords, and I'm sure, I'm sure everybody's heard this 100 times, but it should have a number, a lowercase letter, an uppercase lever, letter, some type of meta character. It should be at least eight characters long. Uh, stronger passwords are phrases. Everybody, if you can remember a phrase, that's even better. I know it's kind of a pain to type in a sentence for a password, but it's still, if you're typing a sentence in for a password, it only takes, you know, maybe it takes two seconds instead of one second. An example of a strong password would be, uh, you know, security is awesome. And you see how we spelled awesome with the meta characters and the zeros. Uh, I wouldn't use that one because it's been published, so it's, it's definitely out all over the world. Uh, protect your passwords. Don't put them in Post-it notes under your keyboards. Don't uh, have them attached to your monitor. Uh, don't have your, your bank account numbers, routing numbers, and, and, and passwords attached to... <clears throat> to any, you know, any place where it's out in the open or where it could be found by somebody potentially uh, wanting to use it. Remember your passwords. If you create a password that's so complicated not to remember it, it's not useful to you. It's not useful to, to anyone. Uh, so I have a, a tale about one password in particular. We uh, I experienced this at a company I worked for. I had a woman that had a password uh, that she used in social media. That email giant is one of the recent uh, email places to get exposed. Uh, her password on her email was also her work email password, which was also her work login password, which was also her Facebook password, and she used her password across everything. So when we were doing a penetration test and the social engineering test, the password that was exposed through her email uh, allowed our white hat hacker to have access to the wiring for a wiring number and all of her bank account information. So she had been storing money to save a or to, saving money to buy a house in New York. And if anybody's seen the residential housing market in New York, we're talking a half million dollars. And so that mistake there, not only could they get into her work account, but they could also get into her personal email account. Uh, where she had all these routing and account numbers and passwords for her account, so she could have lost her. If we had had, a, if it had actually been a hacker and not a test, could have lost her entire life savings. So with passwords, don't use the same password everywhere. Uh, my suggestion would be is if you want, if you can't remember a lot of passwords, is uh, maybe use the same password but end it in the first three digits of the name of the company. So if you have Yahoo Mail, maybe it's you know security is awesome. Yahoo or security, you know, so you, so that you're changing the password for every company, uh, but it's a it's something that's easy to remember uh, in your mind.
And, and Jason, what are, what are your thoughts about password keepers? Uh, password keepers should be encrypted. Uh, if you have a text file on your desktop called passwords and your desktop gets uh, compromised, uh, you've just made it a lot easier for the for the guy trying to get get to your information. So if you use a password keeper, um, use one that's encrypted. Use one that's from a reputable uh, reputable source. You know, I'd love to be able to name one off the top of my head, but the ones I can think of are all stuff that's corporate only. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Yep. Um, so social engineering. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, it's the art of manipulating or lying to other people uh, through the internet. Cyber criminal, it's, the cyber, it's the process of the cyber criminal building trust uh, to get information. Social engineering has many forms. It could be phone calls. It could be, hey, we went to high school together on a LinkedIn conversation. Uh, do you remember me? Join my LinkedIn network. Then they'll look up information uh, that's easily accessible from high school or, or college. Uh, to pretend that they know you, and then they're going to start going towards. They're going to start looking for methods to uh, gain your trust, uh, so that you might expose information that they're looking for. So here, here's some examples. You know, messaging, hey, I noticed you were on social network so and so. In person, hey, I'm Robert. I'm here to upgrade your systems. Uh, the, the one about upgrading your systems is, you know, if, if you have a repairman come to your place of work or your house, and you you know, you're not your AC is not broken, and they're an AC repairman. Um, don't let them in. Uh, you know, call the police. Call your information security department. Uh, if you don't have an information security department, I would recommend calling the police. Uh, if you have a phone call, you, should, you know, and, and they're they're searching for information, you should hang up on them. If it's through a browser conversation, you should close your your browser immediately. Uh, in all these cases, if you're working for a company with an information security department, you should always reach out to information security. Uh, <clears throat> so those those are some of the popular methods, and they're looking to make a friend out of you. Uh, one of the biggest engineering or biggest hacks in, in American telecom history was a guy that showed up on site and pretended that he was a, a telecom operator for, for the uh, mobile cell phone towers and managed to install his own mobile cell, cell phone network on uh, one of the company's towers, just through social engineering. He called the help desk, told me he forgot his password. The help desk didn't follow the protocol, so they gave him a password. So he showed up in a uniform. They looked at the uniform. They let him on site without a badge. Uh, he already had the password, so he logged right in, added his equipment, and then he was able to monitor every telephone conversation on the, on the uh, telephone tower. So email and, and, and uh, instant messaging, uh, it, you know, this is one of those areas where many people have done it, but we should never open emails or instant messages or text messages unless you know who they're from or if you're expecting it. Uh, the attachments, unless you're, you should never open the attachments unless you're expecting it. You should never open links. Uh, unless you're expecting. When you click a link in a text message, it actually ex it can it be used to execute code, which can install spyware on your computer, on your phone. Uh, so unless it's from a trusted person, you should never open those links. Um, if the email seems kind of weird, like, hey, like I mentioned the, the example earlier, uh, I'm, I'm traveling in Europe, but you happen to know the person isn't traveling in Europe, I wouldn't open the, the message as well. Uh, should only visit or download software from pages you trust. If you're particularly on your cell phone, you should only ever put an app on your cell phone. Uh, if you're with an iPhone from the iStore, if you're with Google from Google Play, uh, you should never download a third-party item to put on your phone. Um, n another thing for email is you should never unsubscribe from services you haven't signed up for. So everybody receives the email that says, hey, if you don't want to receive this email anymore, please unsubscribe here. So what unsubscribing does is it tells that company that, hey, we have a live person at the end of this email address. Uh, the unsubscribe link can also be used to install. It doesn't have to actually unsubscribe you. It might put you into a database. So once you unsubscribe, instead of getting one uh, spam email a day, that might turn into 10 spam emails a day. Uh, the unsubscribe can also be used to add, uh, like I said, spyware to your computer. 
So phishing and farming, here's two things that some people know about, some don't. Basically, these are fake emails. They try to act like your bank or a trustworthy entity. Uh, it will ask you for sensitive sensitive information. Uh, they might take, or they'll 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 really try to get you to make immediate action. So everybody's received the email where it says, "Hey, I've uh, it, you, there's this great deal on cell phones. If you want this cell phone, you need to act now. Can we get this amount of information? And we'll transfer your." Your cell, you know, your 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 cell bill over to this new cheaper company. Another one that's quite common right now that's going around. It's both social engineering, email phishing, uh, are the heating companies. Hey, if you go with our heat company, we're going to save you a whole bunch of money on your heating bill. Um, you have to be really leery with these companies because about 50% of them are fake. And uh, in some states, you have the choice of who you want your heating or gas provider to be. Uh, but people are taking advantage of that. But they're making it so if you don't act by the end of the month and go with our heating service, then this great deal we're offering you is no longer going to be available. Uh, so if it, if it appears to be too good to be true, uh, it probably is. So spear phishing. Spear phishing, uh, <clears throat> spear phishing is where they're targeting specific people or specific groups inside of your business. Uh, an example would be a regular phishing attempt would send an email to your entire company uh, pretending to be one person. A spear phishing attempt would be, hey, we need to get an ACH payment or a bank note from somebody, and they only they already have the accounting firm's email address, and they will only, they'll only send uh, the phishing emails to specific people. So they'll appear as a trustworthy entity, uh, like a bank or possibly even a firm you are actually doing business with. They can copy the same contents off the website or other emails from that same business to appear as the same company. Uh, so spear phishing, they're targeting specific individuals with access to specific data. Farming. Uh, is basically fake web pages. Uh, they often provide a link from a phishing email. Uh, the fake page will be branded to look like the real deal. So an example of farming is, is you might receive an a email from the bank that you do business with. Um, it looks like the real email, pretends to be the real email. It's going to say, hey, we noticed your password expired. Please click this link to change your password. So if you haven't changed your password, uh, if, if you you should never use an email to change your password unless you request uh, a password change because what this link does is it's a farming attempt. They've sent you a link that takes you to a fake website, and then when you put in your information on this fake website, it might even appear or might actually be like a middle layer between you and the actual bank site because as you're changing your updating your password or your sensitive user information that fake website can actually record all of that information. Um, so if you ever get an email to take action from your bank and it looks like the real deal, you should never click the link in the email. You should always go and download the, or you should always go to the actual website and log in how you traditionally log in. And banks are pretty good about uh, posting whatever the action steps that you need, banks or, or rapid uh, or pay cards uh, are always good about posting the actual actions that you need to take. So never take direct action from an email. So social networking, uh, manual sharing. Uh, the victims are the main action in the fraud of the scheme. They're malicious, con uh, they share malicious content uh, with their contacts. Uh, it's a fake offering. Social networkers, we're networking uh, users, join a fake event or group uh, that shares the same interest. So how this works with social networking is, is for a long time, Facebook, uh, people were putting fake like buttons on their Facebook sites. And if you hit that fake like button, it was actually allowing them to download your friends list. And once they got your friends list, they would send your friends links to that same like button. And so the first person in the social networking chain was actually the victim because they hit the like, and now they have a chain that has led to everybody else in their social network 
uh, having the same vulnerability. Uh, so once again, if you're in social networking, make sure that you're hitting the, the making sure that the like is a legitimate button and not one that's posted inside of a, another person's comments. Uh, Oh, I'm a little ahead of myself there. Like jacking, using the fake like buttons, attacker tricks users into clicking a website buttons that are used for fraudsters to install malware. Uh, and you can see how that would spread from one person to another. As soon as you hit like, uh, the next person hits it and it spreads to their social networking and downloads their friends list. Uh, comment jacking, the attacker tricks a user into submitting a comment uh, about a link or site which happens to be posted to their wall. So the comment has a link and they're using that link to refute something somebody is saying in their Facebook post. Uh, and you hit that link, and the next thing you know, your computer is compromised. Uh, another thing that's quite common is Facebook is, was famous for quite a while with fake apps. Uh, users are invited to subscribe to applications that appear to be integrated with the Facebook network. Uh, but aren't actually the only integration they have is once you click that app, they can download your, your friends. Uh, installs malware. Uh, it might also perform the service. Uh, you know, it might give you the weather for the day. Uh, which brings me to one of my final comments. Uh, the Internet's forever. I used to talk about this when I was doing information security presentations for the high schools. Anything that you put on the Internet uh, is forever. If you, if you make a comment, that can be searched. If you put an inappropriate picture online, uh, that can be traced back. So anything that you put in social engineering, uh, you should always do with the thought that, you know, what would my boss say? What would my kids say? What would my parents say? Um, because once it's out there, it's really hard to remove. So signs you've been hacked. Uh, you're, you get an antivirus alert would be, would be primary. Your antivirus isn't going to go off in most cases with, you know, 99.99% of the time, unless you have a virus. A virus doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's intentionally hacked you. It just means that a website or a file that you've received uh, has malicious content. Uh, another good sign you've been hacked is when your browser starts taking you to random websites or opens up sites on its own. I've seen many cases where people have brought computers to me where you open up the computer, you go to open up your web browser, uh, and five other web browsers open up with six different sites. Uh, this is usually due to uh, things called search assistance. Uh, the only search that you should ever really use is, is from a primary search provider. You should never install the search assistance. Uh, that actually lets a third party kind of own or compromise your browser. Another way you know you've been hacked is the, if your password no longer works. So if you log into your bank account, your bank account password doesn't work and you're using the same password for your social media account, you might want to check your social media account or vice versa. If you log into your social media account, which is more likely to be hacked, uh, you might want to check your bank account to make sure that your bank account password hasn't also been compromised. Friends or coworkers are receiving odd messages from you. I kind of touched on this a little bit with Facebook. Uh, we've all received strange messages either through text or through email at one point or another from somebody from one of the major email companies that's been compromised. Uh, where the message doesn't necessarily make sense, it might have a lot of spelling mistakes. Uh, it obviously was something not intentionally sent from the person. Uh, these are attempts at kind of a social networking in addition to be hacked where they're wanting you to take some type of action or reply to the email. Uh, and you may have made, people might have uh, installed, accidentally installed malicious software. Uh, meaning you were going out there, you were wanting to find a copy of, let's say, uh, Adobe Reader, and because you wanted to be able to read a PDF, and you went to what you thought was the Adobe Reader site, and it was actually a fake Adobe Reader site, and installed it. So one of the things I can tell you with all of these, if you think you've been hacked, you should go to your IT department or your friend or whoever deals with your computer assets immediately and let them know what you were doing. Sometimes it can be a little embarrassing to let them know what you're doing, but if you let them know what, they're, what you were doing, it gives them a solid starting spot. Um, I've seen, I've experienced a lot of times where people were embarrassed about what they might have been doing at the time that the computer got hacked, uh, so they didn't tell uh, information technology or whoever's working on their computer, and it takes two days to fix the system, where, where it would have been like, hey, 
you know, I was on the site and I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been trying to install the software. This is what I did. It gives the person a, a reasonable location to start and uh, help the user and, and fix the problem. So what should I do? Is there, was there a question there? Uh, so what should I do when you recognize? Like I said, what, you recognize you've been compromised. You should definitely disconnect your device from the network or wireless. Uh, if this is on a home network or a business network, uh, some of these mal malicious bugs are, are intelligent enough to be able to crawl across the same subnet, meaning if one person in one cube gets it, it's going to attempt to crawl to everybody that has the same vulnerability in the building. Uh, so disconnecting it from the network is important. You should contact your help desk or information security immediately. Uh, and like I said, be honest with the activities leading to the compromise. As I can tell you, in most cases, uh, the IT guys are the last people to judge on anything you're doing on your computer. Um, they will be thankful that it took them 30 minutes to fix the issue uh, rather than a number of days. And, and thank you, Jason. That was that was great information. And, and I guess how does this this relate to the fraud generation for the next uh, fraud prevention for the next generation of, of pay cards? And that's that's what I'm going to dis discuss now. And I'm going to call on Jason. Uh, at, at times for his expertise. Um, but, but as Jason mentioned, um, you know, there are all these breaches. Both debit and credit card data breaches have been dominating the headlines for the last 18 to, to 24 months. Um, you, you guys all know, um, you know, the big retailers that have had these data breaches, um, and, you know, those are just the ones that you hear of. Uh, there are many, many, many smaller um, you know, data breaches that are happening every day uh, at, at retailers across the nation uh, that, that don't make the headlines. Um, there are also so three initials that I'm sure you've heard before, EMV, that stands for EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa, uh, the three processing firms that in 2002 first agreed to, to standards to help prevent, uh, to prevent fraud. Um, and, and EMV, uh, which you guys might know by a different name, is, uh, is chip and pin card or smart card, and that actually contains a, a special computer chip uh, to store card account data. Um, you know, most of the cards in your wallet now probably are a, uh, are a, uh, a chip card. Um, some interesting stats here is that uh, most card fraud actually occurs in the, in the United States, and, and in fact, uh, 2015 research note from Barclays stated that the United States is responsible for 47% of the world's card fraud, despite only accounting for 24% uh, of the total uh, worldwide volume. That's, uh, that's staggering, and, and we're going to tell you about, about what, what we're doing to prevent it and what are some of those tools out there uh, to, to help prevent some of this fraud. Um, just another uh, you know, a really important uh, statistic here. Uh, the total value of, of card not present transactions. Um, so that is, those are online transactions, uh, transactions that, that really cannot be stopped by, by those chip and pin cards, um, is expected to grow from $9 billion uh, in 2013, uh, so just a couple of years ago, uh, to nearly $19 billion uh, in 2018, as the fraud at the point of sale uh, shrinks uh, because of whether it's either chip and pin or, or uh, all these other fraud tools that we're going to tell you about besides that, that chip and pin, as, as they get out there in the market, um, the fraud will then begin to shift uh, to card not present transactions. And uh, experts predict fraud will remain a growing problem uh, for years to come, and that is why pay card providers are diligently working to utilize proactive tools uh, did not significantly tilt the risk-reward balance for prepaid debit card uh, fraud prevention by negatively impacting the daily cardholder user experience. It's, it's, you know, we do not want to do anything that's going to negatively affect the cardholder, but of course you also want to stop fraud. So I do want to talk about uh, a couple different methods of fraud prevention. Um, and uh, there, there are two two kind of fundamental methods to stopping pay card fraud. Uh, the first is what's known as geofencing, and then the second is actually a more sophisticated tool, uh, a neural network. So uh, geofencing, so some providers out in the market have, have elected to utilize a simplistic solution called geofencing, 
and geofencing is, is really exactly what it sounds. It's, it's creating a virtual perimeter or fence for real-world geographic uh, areas uh, that limit card usage to predefined boundaries. So an example would be if you want to lock, uh, you lock down the state of New York, um, where if a cardholder had to leave the state, they'd have to call, uh, you know, to get their card unblocked. And you may recognize this with maybe one of your cards. Um, that's pretty cumbersome for, for a cardholder, um, especially, you know, we'll use the state of New York. That, that's where I'm from, where I grew up. I was actually able to be in New Jersey in 15 minutes, and I can be in Connecticut in 15 minutes. Really cumbersome for me as a cardholder if my card had, had just had geofencing, uh, because every time I, I move states, which might be, you know, if I'm on the job, uh, you know, many times during the day, would have to then call or go online or use a mobile app in order to uh, to, to unlock that card. So, so there's a, a risk reward. Uh, this one, um, you know, it. You get rewarded, but it's 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 very risky and very cumbersome for that that card holder. Alex, Another, you mind if I uh, embellish that story a little bit? Yes, go for it. All right. So here's an example I deal with our with our I've dealt with 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 our fraud team. One of the major advantages of neural network. If you can go to that previous slide where it shows that map, we experience a situation where if you are in a geofencing environment and how geofencing works is it you're changing these state lines or these county lines, and there's a velocity check. So your card can only be used within X number of miles within a certain amount of time. So if you got up in the morning in Connecticut and took the train through and, and got a paid for your train ticket in the morning in Connecticut, bought a coffee while you were in New York, then then uh, got off the bus and or off the uh, off the train in New Jersey and bought a paper. Uh, with geofencing, your card would be flagged because you've now been in three states in under 30 minutes, and it's going to turn off your card, and it's going to cause an inconvenience for you, or the, the we're going to call you and say, hey, is this actually you? The advantage of using that neural network is that the neural network actually learns your patterns. So if you are taking that train every day from Connecticut to New Jersey, it's going to say, hey, this person always buys a coffee here, and we know that that train goes through New York, and that's where the ticket that's you know the ticket was purchased in Connecticut. We know the train goes through New York, and they buy a coffee, and we know they get their morning paper in New Jersey. The advantage of the neural network is, is it actually uses high-end algorithms and, and remembers uh, spending patterns. So it's not looking for solid boundaries; it's looking for abnormalities to your daily routine. Um, which is a much stronger case. And, and Jason, how, how do you know so much about neural networks? Did you did you work on those previously? Jason, did I lose you? We may have lost Jason there, but uh, just a uh, and that is why I'm rapid sorry. pay card. Yeah. So I'll, let me answer real quick. I was on. I put myself on hold accidentally. Or not on, yeah, on hold. <laughs> so I did actually work on neural networking with the U.S. government back in the nineteen in, in the early nineteen nineties, and it was to create code uh, faster uh, because you can, if a coder codes for a specific instance, like say in a video game, and you're facing a bunch of opponents, and those opponents always do the same thing, uh, and then you figure out a trick in the video game where you can always defeat that sequence of events. Uh, the government wanted to make games that couldn't be defeated once the person figured out the pattern. So by creating a neural network, the game actually gets smarter. So if you are always using the same method of solving the test or the same method in the game of defeating the opponents, the opponents are smart enough to begin randomly creating this code because a coder can only create code for the events that they can imagine. And what happens is you get people out there to think outside the box and manage to defeat that code. A neural network is going to learn those patterns and adjust as, as like I said, with technology always adjusting, it will, it will adjust in time with those adjustments that the cyber criminals are making or with the adjustments just as far as being able to use your money. If your work pattern changes, it will be able to adjust and know that, hey, this is still this user and be able to identify that. So. Thank, thank you, Jason, and and that is why one of the reasons why Rapid Pay Card does utilize a, a neural network solution. 
uh, that, that leverages a debit scoring model uh, from, from Fair Isaac. So uh, every single one of the transactions that, that are transactioned uh, for Rapid Pay Card actually gets a score, uh, a fraud score, and that's likely to predict whether that's a, a real transaction or a fraudulent transaction. Why that's important is, as Jason said, it is, it is not as cumbersome to the, to the cardholder. Uh, they're not going to be flagged if they're, you know, just simply moving between state lines, someone who lives close to the, close to the border. Um, it's really that, that ideal balance for the, you know, stopping fraud and also providing a, a good cardholder experience for our cardholders, which, you know, many of them are in, the, uh, you know, work in the staffing industry, so they may be traveling from, from work site to, uh, to work site. Um, so these predictive models are used to determine uh, uh, fraud potential at each ATM and point of sale transaction, uh, transaction by evalu uh, evaluating it against cardholder usage patterns. Um, as well as, you know, characteristics of fraud. So, again, it, it begins to learn cardholder behavior. It knows, um, you know, what's, you know, it's possible for a transaction to happen in New York and then New Jersey 15 minutes later, but not New York and then California 15 minutes later. So what the system will actually do is actually uh, flag and block the transactions that are outside of that, uh, of the, the pattern or the characteristic. And then, as we spoke about earlier, a, a lot of the fraud will be moving on uh, the card not present, present so online. The, the uh, neural network also helps to stop that fraud as well. So, um, some more about the, the neural network, uh, the transaction industry, cardholder and merchant data, all the data that, that, that's out there we use to, uh, to forecast the likelihood of, of fraud. Um, so counterfeit card fraud is only part of the story. Uh, prepaid card providers must manage the risk associated with money laundering, terrorist financing, internal and external fraud prevention, and help to ensure uh, compliance laws, laws and regulations to com combat these crimes. So separate from the neural network, uh, there is a whole group of, of risk analysts and, and teams behind the scenes uh, that are working to prevent all of these. So money laundering and terrorist financing um, uh, to, to help prevent to prevent fraud as well. Um, and just some, some important information uh, about, about pay cards in, in general. Um, you know, there are valuable tools for employers uh, that could save, save you money each time if you're printing paychecks uh, by, by transitioning them to direct deposit uh, instead of paying them by paper checks. Uh, and then employees, they, they get all these tools that we spoke about. Um, cash, if cash is lost, it's, it's gone forever. Uh, if, if, if the funds are on a card, uh, they're protected by the, the neural network. They're protected by all the, the fraud preventions that are, on, uh, that are behind the scenes. Um, employees also have, uh, benefit by having the, the dignity of online and point of sale purchasing, ability to easily check their balances, and uh, by taking advantage of, of both custom uh, alerts and text and, and mobile apps. And then finally, um, uh, we help payroll leaders find efficiencies and give time back uh, to, to the profession. Um, so compliance updates are easily managed, timely and accurately. Staffing and resources have streamlined and effective processes and reporting is simplified using a single source of, of truth. And Amanda, I think we are able to, uh, to move to questions. Wonderful. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them in the chat or the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll also open up a poll for you to give us your feedback as we're going through the questions today. I do have a couple of questions that have come in, so I will start with those. Um, can you tell what is a good frequency for changing passwords on your computer? Jason, I'll so, you that. Uh, yeah, the, the government requirement and the, all the, like from NIST and ISO, and everybody will tell you every 90 days. Um, if you change it every 90 days, or if you feel, if you're even remotely, you know, I would say change it every 90 days, but if you have any remote suspicion uh, that you're, you have an account that was compromised, I would change it immediately. Um, but 90 days is the recommended number. Okay. Is it true that uh, opening emails on a Mac to see if, it, if it's a legit email or to, to use a Mac versus a PC is a safer way to check if you're unsure um, of an email? 
Um, absolutely untrue. Uh, if you're worried about an email, uh, you probably shouldn't open it. Uh, if you really want to do it, you'd want to open it in some type of text-only reader. Uh, people, believe it or not, do actually write uh, viruses for Macs as well. Uh, so they're just, it's just not as common because there's not as many. Your, people tend to write viruses for, for the largest platform, so 90% of your viruses are written for Windows, but there are viruses for Macintoshes as well. So if you're suspicious of it at all, it might just be a harmful app that accidentally opens and then runs on the Mac. So um, it's just as dangerous on both platforms. Okay. Um, what is your experience with uh, the Outlook reading pane? Uh, if it auto-opens emails, in a sense, is, is that a dangerous way to view your emails? So the, the Outlook, uh, the auto-panes like that, anything that's in the auto-pane, the auto-pane can't execute anything. So it's safe to do, the, it's like a preview mode. Uh, it's safe to look at it from the auto pane. Uh, you wouldn't want to interact with anything from the auto pane. But at that point, it's not actually executing any code. It's just going through uh, dumb background, what's called dumb HTML in the background. So it is, you're, it's always safe to look at it in the auto pane. Okay. Um, and what are your thoughts on the auto save um, of passwords on different websites or different um, systems that you may use? Uh, you, really, I wouldn't use any of them because any time a browser is compromised or you do something that, uh, uh, just, uh, well, any time you do anything, just a second, I have somebody, there we go, all right, I was getting another caller. Um, Anytime you do anything that might compromise your browser, if it stores those, uh, not all the browsers automatically store them in an encrypted format. So, I mean, the recommendation would be is to never use the auto remember uh, function. And how would, uh, what is a safe way to transmit sensitive data? Um, as a staffing company, it's often necessary to send sensitive information um, to different parties that may need it for for various uh, legitimate purposes. All right, so the safest way to transmit sensitive data is to always encrypt it. The easiest way to encrypt it, uh, 7-Zip has a free program, uh, because I know that, that not everybody has, you know, $120 per person to license something. Uh, a company called 7-Zip has a product where when you do the password on their zip file, it automatically encrypts the file. Uh, so you password encrypt the file uh, to be sent, and then uh, most regulations would tell you to send the password in two parts uh, in two separate emails or to two separate people. Uh, I know that seems a little more complicated, but the, at least the best step for most people would be to never put the password in the same email with the file. So you'd password encrypt the file and then send the password in a separate email. Or to call and verbally give them the password? Or you can call, yep, calling and verbally giving the password is, is is the best solution, but uh, if you're dealing with government agencies, that's not always actually a, a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how do you know if your identity has been stolen? Um, usually, if you know that your identity has been stolen, it's too late because you're, you're, you're receiving uh, some type of bill for something you didn't purchase. Uh, eBay is sending you something saying, hey, congratulations, you won uh, such and such, and you log into eBay and you know that your address doesn't match. Uh, anytime that you receive a notification uh, that you're getting something or have been charged for something uh, that, that you didn't buy uh, is, an, is a strong indicator. Okay. Training is, is um, an important aspect of, of trying to um, protect sensitive data. Do you have any suggestions or takeaways uh, for the staffing companies on the line today for training their staff on some of the primary things that they should know or look at um, for protecting the either employee or customer sensitive data? Um, there's a lot of online resources uh, that are really good. Uh, it would take too long to, to list them all. Uh, in our case, uh, we go by the PCI guidelines, and 90% uh, of it is really how you store 
sensitive information and how you protect access to it. So the, the one that we would follow, which is really strict, would be the, the PCI DSS 3.2 guidelines. They have a whole section dedicated to protecting user data. Um, and the PCI guideline does a good job of combining uh, NIST and ISO kind of have a very cumbersome, kind of not simple or hard to understand. PCI does, it takes those stronger, harder to understand uh, ideas and kind of compresses them down into uh, something that's more easily understandable and followable by everybody. Um, most of the topics I talked about today, if you can get if you can get your users to protect themselves, uh, they will protect, and and you you get you train them to protect uh, their clients as they would themselves, is is usually usually one of the strongest methods of prevention, uh, and then make security part of of, of every day. Um, it's not you can't have a secure company if everybody doesn't receive the training. So. Um, start with the little things and work your way on to the, the, the smaller things. Password rules, everything that I kind of covered earlier with, you know, as far as how you handle social media and not using the same password on all your different uh, account types, um, those are all important. So most of the topics that I would say that you should cover at least annually uh, or each time somebody new is brought on board would be the, the uh, first section of the slides. When looking at a pay card provider, are there specific security questions that a staffing company should ask that provider um, to ensure that the information um, that that, that um, pay card company is going to have is going to be secured? It, yes, yes. So, so, so making sure that they are PCI compliant is important. Asking what their their fraud prevention so neural network. Uh, or, or you know, the lesser geofencing for for cardholders, um, dual factor authentication for for any type of websites or or, or portals um, uh, are, are just some of the things that that should be asked. Wonderful. I don't see that we've had any other questions come in. Um, is there anything else that that you would like to um, cover? Or, um, final thoughts. Amanda, uh, again, uh, we, we want to thank the group for the opportunity and thank TRICOM for the opportunity to uh, present this webinar today. Um, we're planning uh, another one in the, in the near future on a, on a different subject uh, that, uh, that you'll all be, uh, I think, interested in. So for now, uh, thank you very much from Rapid Pay Card and uh, have a great day. Wonderful. Thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to present the webinar today and for all of your knowledge on payroll security and fraud prevention. We will have a recording of this presentation available on our website at tricom.com. It's under the industry resources, um, it's resources, industry insider webinars tab. And again, thank you so much for joining us today and watch for information on our next webinar session. Thank you.